Hello, hello. Welcome to the post lunch session. We're going to start. Thank you. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you've been enjoying PyCon US so far. Here is a random panda bear for you because I love panda bears. Um, this picture, <laughs> yay. <laughs> Cool, lots of panda lovers here. So this picture was taken at the San Diego Zoo. Um, if you're ever in San Diego, I would highly recommend going to the zoo and checking out the pandas because they're awesome. But you might wonder why is she talking about panda bears. Um, DjangoCon US is coming to San Diego in October, which would make for a fantastic excuse to come and visit the pandas and the zoo and beautiful San Diego. And our CFP is open until June 3rd, so I can only encourage you to come. Uh, we're not only looking for Django-related talks, anything web development or Python is welcome, and I'm happy to chat more about it. Um, this is my first time speaking at PyCon US, um, and I'm super excited, also nervous, that I get to be here today. I tried for three or four years in a row to get a proposal accepted, and it finally worked this year. So if this is you, don't give up, keep trying. It's going to work at some point. And thank you so much again to all of you for being here. Um, I would first like to introduce myself. So my name's Anna, I'm from Germany. I always say I come from a different universe a little bit because I did get my bachelor's degree in English and Catholic theology and you might I might have identified William Shakespeare and Pope Francis here on my slide. But about four years ago, I got involved in Python and in the Python and Django communities and started teaching myself coding. I like tech, um, but I also really like people, so I kind of like working at the intersection of both, which is why I work um, on the developer relations team of Elastic at the moment. In my free time, I'm involved in a few other tech-related things. I'm DjangoCon US um, diversity chair. I'm PyCon US open spaces advisor, and I helped with the guidebook this year, and I'm one of the leaders of the PyLadies remote group. I've also organized a couple of Django Girls workshops, the most recent ones being in Omaha, Nebraska, and in San Francisco. Um, I'm affected by mental illness, and the reason I am mentioning that is because I would like for all of us to speak about the topic more openly and to kind of normalize it a little bit. Um, at Melanie, my friend Melanie and I are hosting an open space on Sunday at 2 p.m. in room 19 on mental health. So if you're interested in the topic, please stop by. But today I'm actually here to talk to you all about making your open source project successful. Um, I would like to give a big shout out to Tom Christie, who is the creator of Django REST Framework. Um, and I've had the honor to work with Tom on REST Framework for a long time. And all of what I've learned about open source pretty much comes from my time of working with Tom. Um, before I start, I would first like to do a very small informal survey. Who of you contribute to open source? Yay, that's so many of you, cool. Who of you are open source project maintainers? Okay, cool. And who of you have not contributed yet but are thinking about doing so? Okay, also, cool. Um, today this talk actually is not about me. Um, I would like for you to meet Grace and Ada. Uh, Grace, for, Grace works for, a, they both work for a software company with an open source business model. They work on the same team. Ada is a self-taught software engineer who attended a Django Girls workshop and then started teaching herself coding. And Grace has a more traditional background and she's been working in tech for five years. Um, and Grace, Ada is a very um, active contributor to open source, and Grace contributes to open source as well, and recently started her own project. But as you will see throughout this talk, Grace's project could use some help. Today, imagine this is Grace's and Ada's office, and they have a conversation in the office, and we're kind of eavesdropping in and hearing what they're talking about. Um, their company recently launched a program. Um, this is the email that the CEO sent out to all employees, which will let employees nominate their favorite open source projects, which the company then will donate money to. This actually is a real life project, which we're working on launching at Elastic at the moment. And this email starts the conversation about open source between the two women. Um, and they start brainstorming a couple of open source projects. They come up with Python, Django, Beware. Beware also has an awesome booth in the expo hall, and Elasticsearch. 
Grace isn't super sure what open source really means in her own words, so she asks Ada to explain it to her really quickly. And Ada comes up with this definition, and she says that open source means that code is publicly accessible, it is reusable, and it is modifiable. And she mentions the importance of open source communities and contributors which help open source projects thrive. Ada also says when most of us think open source, we think code. But what we don't consider is that an open source project consists of so many more components than just code, which you cannot neglect, such as marketing, documentation, or funding. Grace starts to wonder why so many open source projects struggle with funding, although the tech industry is so wealthy. Ada explains to her that sadly a lot of companies don't realize how much they rely on these projects and how important it is to give back. Giving back can be done by having your developers work on code or documentation. Some of you may have jobs where you get to contribute to open source as part of your day job. Um, but that simply is not enough. A lot of projects actually need money. And by supporting open source, you don't only give back, you also give forward because you make sure that the maintenance um, and development of the project is sustained. Imagine if your favorite open source project that you use in your free time or at work wasn't maintained anymore. No bug fixes, new features, the maintainer just would choose to not merge any pull requests anymore. It would get really problematic after a while. Um, Tom Christie, for example, has a very successful fundraising uh, model. Tom actually works on open source full time. It's his day job to work on open source, and I'll talk a little bit later more about how he does that. Um, so Grace says that she sees all these people asking on Twitter for donations to their Patreons for community and open source work. And she says to Ada that she tried that recently. She released this cool new feature that we, she was really excited about, but no one donated and no one cared about the feature. And Ada asks her, Grace, did you actually ask people for input on this new feature? And Grace kind of starts to stutter around and admits that she ignored people's feedback and that she did it anyway because she was really excited. Um, Ada smiles and says that she just saw a tweet about it this morning. And the tweet saying, um, I'm going to read it out loud in case some of you can see this. Um, users don't hate change. Users hate when you take control from them. Users hate when your change shows no value for them. Users hate when they've invested in learning your design only for you to disregard that investment. Users don't hate change. It's you, not them. Um, and Ada says that the person tweeting this might be a bit grumpy, but I think at the core he's right. Um, she explains to Grace how her own open source project will be much more successful if she actually starts listening to people and listening to their opinions and taking into account what they're saying. Um, she emphasizes the importance of responding to people and making them feel heard. If you just keep ignoring people's comments, then they're going to go away at one point. Um, she suggests that Grace is transparent and apologizes for her mistake and also um, lets people know her reasoning for implementing this feature. And Grace is kind of starting to understand what she did wrong, and she says that she will try and fix it. Um, Ada also says that when we ask for money, we also need to offer our financial supporters something valuable in return. You can't just take people's money and then go and do whatever with it. People need to feel appreciated, and they need to feel like they get something in return. You want, to help the, you want the community to help you, so you also need to help the community. Um, open source projects like Django REST Framework, for example, follow a monthly subscription-based donation models. Um, so the way it works is that individual contributors, such as freelancers will donate $15 a month, and companies will donate anywhere from $50 to $400 a month. And in return, they get advertising on GitHub and on the website. They also get priority support from Tom Christie, which means that he will help you out within tw 24 um, hours. Um, and this, this approach is really valuable because subscription-based services are an easier and more stable commitment for people. 
Or some people will use Kickstarters. You might have supported open source Kickstarters. Um, I often see that people don't really stick to their promises. Like they will say, in six months, I will implement these and this, these features if you donate money to my Kickstarter and they don't deliver. It's not the problem that people don't deliver, it's that they don't communicate. So if you're asking for money, just make sure to be transparent and to communicate with your financial supporters. Give them regular status updates. Grace thinks about what Ada says for a second, and then she asks her how she can give her own contributors something valuable in return and how she can build those relationships. And Ada emphasizes again that Grace should just start listening to people and really hear them. And she also acknowledges that sometimes when you ask for feedback, you may hear things that you don't want to hear. But keep in mind that those people who will kind of always just tell you positive things, they're not really your friends. Sometimes you need those people to kind of give you the hard truths to know how you can improve. Um, she recommends for Grace to establish good communication systems in order to especially cultivate new contributors. They will need a way to reach out if they have questions or if they need help. Answer questions in Slack, in IRC, in Discuss, Twitter, or GitHub. And make sure that you engage with people via the means they choose to engage with you. So that means if someone reaches out via IRC, don't respond to them via email. Um, some projects also release monthly project reports or newsletters. In, at Elastic, we um, have a monthly roadmap series for all of our open source projects, for example. Let people know how you're spending your time, what you're using their money for, what you need help with, and how they can get involved. And Ada asks Grace if she ever thanks her contributors for or recognizes their contributions. And Grace says, well, no one has ever thanked me when I contributed, so why should I do that? Um, and then Grace asks, uh, Ada asks Grace if she still contributes to these projects, if she enjoyed contributing without ever being appreciated, and she says no. So Grace smiles and should suggests that um, Ada so Ada smiles and suggests that Grace starts thanking people. Um, and a cool way to thank people are happiness packets. I don't know if you've heard about happiness packets. It's this cool project that two friends of mine called Sasha and Mikey built. And because they thought that people in open source need more ways to say, hey, I appreciate you, I personally try to send one happiness packet a week at least. Um, it's totally free to use. I would recommend that you check it out. It's really cool. Um, also, when saying thank you to your contributors, don't forget to thank everyone. So don't only thank the core contributors that contribute code. Also thank the people who work on ticket triage, documentation, marketing. There are so many ways you can do that. You can do happiness packets, you can do shout outs on Twitter, you can thank people in your release notes, you can send them special stickers. It doesn't have to be anything big as long as you really try. Suddenly, in the middle of the conversation, Grace gets an email notification. Someone opened an issue on GitHub because they have trouble installing her software. And she sighs and tells Ada that this happens quite often, and she doesn't really understand why, because she thought her documentation was just brilliant. Um, so Ada asks her if she can see the documentation. And it sort of looks like this. Uh, step one, run this command. Step two, magic happening in between. And step three, the software should work now. Um, Ada takes a look and mentions that maybe the documentation is just a little bit brief. And she pulls up something on her phone and tells Grace that it sort of looks like this. Um, I don't know if you can see this. It says, how to draw an owl. Step one, draw some circles. Step two, draw the rest of the owl. Um, Ada explains that it's best not to assume people, not to assume that people know how to do something, but just to write very thorough documentation. The people who know how to do it can just skip over those little steps in between. Um, so if you know how to draw an owl, you don't need all the five steps in between that we forgot there. But if you don't know how to draw an owl, then it's actually super helpful. And I don't know about you, but if I can't install something or if I want to contribute and I can't get it done within like 30 minutes to an hour and I can't get any help, then I probably will give up and find something else which is easier to uh, make work for me. Um, Grace stresses, Ada stresses the importance of good documentation because bad documentation keeps people from using and contributing to your project. Um, Ada also recommends adding screenshots to your README and documentation, maybe add some GIFs. I really like GIFs of you helping in um, some code. It's really helpful. Maybe as an open source project maintainer, actually steer your contributors to submit documentation when they 
submit a patch or it will not get accepted. Um, or maybe encourage documentation first. This will um, make people think about the benefits of their change before they start thinking about how to implement that change. So Grace is kind of defensive still, and she says, well, most people know how to figure it out. And Ada says, well, maybe there were just a lot of people who didn't, but they weren't brave enough to step up and ask for help and say something. And then Grace says, well, I don't know what's wrong with my documentation because it totally makes sense to me. I wrote it. I know how to use it. It works for me. Um, and Ada says, um, that does make sense because once you work on a project for a really long time, you kind of start to forget what was hard for you in the be beginning. So it's actually really helpful to ask newbies to a project to um, improve the documentation. Ideally, you, you want your documentation to work for everyone, even the newest contributor. So Ada suggests that Grace help them um, install the software, figure out what went wrong, and then ask them to submit a patch to improve the documentation. So Grace pulls up this, Git, their person, this person's GitHub profile and she sees that they've never made a pull request before. And she feels bad because she doesn't want to ask them to make a documentation change because, you know, it's just the docs. It doesn't in involve writing code. I'm being sarcastic here, by the way. Um, Ada explains to her how open source projects need contributors of all skill levels and expertise. You don't only need the experienced coders. If we just keep relying on the experienced people, then what are we going to do if those people um, leave for whatever reason one day? We need to cultivate the, new, the next generation of new contributors in order to make our project sustainable. She explains how all contributions are important, even the smallest bug or documentation fixes. So my very first um, pull request was one to the James Girls tutorial and it was just fixing grammar and punctuation mistakes but it was still important because I got that practice of uh, submitting a pull request and it made the tutorial easier to read for everyone. If you are curious what your first ever pull request was, there's this cool website it's called firstpr.me. Um, it only works for GitHub um, but I would still test it out. It's really pretty cool. I, I liked seeing it. Um, Grace says, okay, um, but she doesn't have time to mentor this person and she doesn't feel qualified enough to do so. Um, and she doesn't have time, that's usually the excuse, I don't feel qualified, I don't have time, and so on. Um, maybe you are kind of catching yourself there, um, maybe you've said something like this before. Um, Ada encourages her to think about it, and she um, encourages her to think about her start in open source and how there were probably people who helped her and how it is important um, to pay it forward. She says that Grace could even establish a mentorship program for her open source project and mention it in the README that she welcomes first-time contributors and how people can reach out to her if she needs help. She also suggests that Grace labels issues according to diff difficulty and reserves easy bugs for first-time contributors. Contributors. Um, Ada says that mentorship actually doesn't have a whole, doesn't have to take a whole lot of time. I gave a whole talk on mentorship a few conferences ago. It's up on YouTube if you're interested. But just one hour or two hours a week. I do speaker mentorship at the moment, and I do maybe like one or two calls a week, and it's super helpful to the person, but it's also super rewarding to me because I get to help them. And trust me, helping others is the best feeling in the world, and seeing other people succeed is also the best feeling in the world. So Ada says that she attended PyCon a few years ago and someone took the time to sit down with her during the sprints and help her make an open source contribution. Um, if you're staying for the sprints, I would highly encourage you to do that or if you find some, grab a table in the hallway and help other people contribute. It can be really simple. Grace is excited about Ada's idea and wants to start mentoring right away. Her enthusiasm doesn't last very long, sadly. Um, she pulls the, up the GitHub repository of Elasticsearch, and she sees that the project has over a 1,000 contributors. And she gets all sad um, and says to Ada how she wishes her own project had more contributors. 
Ada recommends that she looks for contributors among her users. They use the project, so it's likely that they rely on it, enjoy it, and are happy to give back. Gra Ada also recommends that Grace gives people incentives for contributing. At Elastic, for example, we give, we give these cool pins to community organizers, um, and they're actually really affordable to buy, but people love them. You will sometimes see people like pinning them on their jacket or their shirt, and other people see them and ask, hey, how can I get this? And then you say, well, if you're a community organizer, you would get one. Or you might have heard of Beware. Uh, Russell Keith McGee, who's the founder of Beware, he gives out these cool challenge coins if you contribute. I think he's going to do it at the sprints again. So just come up with any incentives for people to contribute to your project. They can be really, really simple and affordable. Um, Ada then asks Grace what she's doing to promote her project, and Grace says, well, I tweet about it sometimes from my personal account, maybe like once a month or so. Um, and Ada tells her that marketing is actually really important and that tweeting from your personal account once a month is not enough because it doesn't really reach a lot of people. And without marketing, no one simply knows about your open source project. She tells Grace that her pro project needs a nice website, including a blog with well-curated and interesting content. It needs its own active Twitter account. It needs a mailing list. and it also also needs people to evangelize, talk about the open source project at conferences, run sprints at conferences, and so on. Grace says, well, but I don't really like Twitter, and I'm not really good at social media and marketing. Um, so Ada says, that's fine. Um, why don't you find people from the community to, um, I will explain that in a minute, to contribute um, and help you. This is exactly what she meant when she says that open source projects need, need people of all skill levels and expertise to contribute. Grace might not like Twitter and social media, but other people love social media, other people love event organizing, other people love design. Um, we have so many different talents which we can all use to help out open source projects. So you might think, what is this Wonder Woman gopher doing up there? Um, um, the woman who made this is called Ashley McNamara. Ashley works for Microsoft, and she's very big in the Go community, but she's also a ve very talented artist. And so she created a website called goforize.me, uh, where you can create a gopher version of yourself, which is really um, cool. And it, it has nothing to do with code, but it's important for the community because they love it. So while we take, while Ada and Grace take a very quick coffee break, um, I would like for you to just quickly think about one talent other than coding that you have uh, in order to uh, help out an open source project or, or community. I'm just going to take a quick water break and you think about one talent. I hope that you keep thinking about this and really try to think how can I help out open source projects with other talents other than coding, or maybe it'll also help you to encourage people new to coding. I know that my first PyCon, PyCon sprints, I was intimidated because I didn't know, I, I felt like I wasn't experienced enough, so just keep that in mind and encourage people. But back to Grace and Ada. Uh, Ada emphasizes that an open source project doesn't only need contributor diversity of talents, it also needs diversity of contributors. And with diversity, she means more than just women. She means um, people of different ethnicities, people of different age groups, people of different sexual orientations, and also people of different educational backgrounds. Grace shares with Ada that she struggles with assigning tasks to people when they do offer to help. And Ada says that open source project management can be really quite difficult, and she recommends to assign roles to people, give people ownership. This is kind of a win-win situation because it makes Grace's life easier because she can give some of the work to someone else, but it also makes the person feel appreciated. Like, think about yourself. If you are assigned a certain role or you get leadership about something, you feel good about yourself right? You feel like that other person is really trusting you to do a good job. So she recommends that um, Grace assigns role to contributors and then these contributors can delegate, ta delegate tasks to newbies. Um, she says that ticket triage is one of those fields. Um, if there weren't people who worked on ticket triage, then tickets wouldn't get assessed, bugs wouldn't get fixed, um, and so on. 
Grace says that she really is not good with ticket triage and that she would really like for someone to help her. She struggles with determining which issues are important and urgent and which aren't. Um, Ada says that for ticket triage, it's important to learn to say no. When you see an issue and you know that you won't tackle this issue within the next six months, then maybe say no to it and close it. Um, bugs are a little bit different, but again, if you know that you won't work on a bug in the next six months, maybe close it as a known limitation and document it instead, in order of instead of cluttering up your repository with a bunch of maybes and nice to haves. Um, Grayson says she really doesn't like communicating with people about issues and she's really not good about getting people engaged and communicating with them in general. And that might be one of the reasons that her open source project isn't that successful. Um, and Ada mentions that really community is key. The reason that the Python community and the Python open source project is so successful is really its community. You need community um, for, for anything. You can't go alone. Open source projects are only sustainable if you involve the community. You have to make sure that current contributors are happy. You have to cultivate new contributors. Without a good community, your project won't be successful. And you might have heard, this is Brett Cannon um, on the slide. You might have heard his famous quote, I came for the language, but I stayed for the community. I can definitely say that that's true for me because I currently don't even write code for a living, but I'm still um, a member of the Python community, and I'm speaking at PyCon today. Um, Grace is scrolling through Twitter and she sees yet another heated discussion about code of conduct. Um, and Ada asks her if her own project has a code of conduct, and Grace says no, there's never been a need for it because everyone's always friendly. Um, and Ada says that it's a really common misconception to only implement a code of conduct after something bad has happened. Instead, you should implement a code of conduct right away just in case something bad happens. In fact, by not having a co code of conduct, you might actually lose contributors. And Ada recommends the Contributor Covenant. It's open source, it's free to use for you, and it's been tra um, translated into many different languages. So if your own open source project does not have a code of conduct yet, please do me a favor and implement one as soon as possible. Um, Grace thanks Ada for all of her recommendations, and she says that she has a meeting in five minutes, but that she sh they should quickly write down um, all of Ada's tips. So to sum it up, I'm just going to run through these really quick because I'm running out of time. Uh, listen to your contributors, be, responses, of, be responsive, offer your financial supporters something valuable in return, establish good communication systems, thank all contributors of your project, write thorough documentation, including screenshots and GIFs, acknowledge all contributions as equally important, find contributors of all skill levels and expertise, offer mentorship, provide contribution incentives, work on a website, work on marketing, including a website and a blog, a Twitter account, a mailing list, and evangelism, recognize the importance of diversity of contributors and talents, give contributors ownership, learn to say no to bugs and issues you won't fix in the next six months, document them instead, nurture your community, and last but not least, add a code of conduct and be willing to enforce it. Um, Grace and Ada aren't specific people. All of us could be Grace and Ada. Maybe you have found yourself a little bit in Ada or in Grace. You've recognized some of the behaviors um, and some of the conversations that they had today. Um, I hope that you take some of the tips to heart and maybe implement the one thing or another into your own open source project. Most of all, I hope that we can all learn to be kind to each other as open source project maintainers, contributors, and users, as Pythonistas, as humans. Everyone we come across in this world fights a battle we know nothing about, so just try to be kind always. Uh, one more thing, um, I run this thing called PyLadies Remote. We're always looking for new teachers. You can find more information on Twitter or on the website. If you're interested in teaching a class, please reach out to us. Um, I don't have time for Q&A right now, but I would love to take questions later in the hallway or on Twitter. I'm at OSSANA16 on Twitter. I will also be hanging out at the Elastic booth later. We have really cool socks and other swag, so please stop by. Um, I hope you enjoy PyCon US, enjoy Cleveland, and have an awesome day, and thank you so much again for being here.